This is Matt Brown, and you're listening to Just a Good Conversation. You can say Jason Howey is a recovering photojournalist, or you can say he's just a local kid who loved his small town of Chico and never really wanted to leave it. I mean, as I say now, it's like the camera's my passport. With that camera, I get to go places and see things and walk into spaces and rooms and what's happening over here. And the camera kind of allows me to kind of be that, you know, key to open those doors up for me. I'm Matt Brown, host of Just a Good Conversation. Take a listen to my archives. My guests have ranged from small business owners, Hall of Fame basketball players, and professor of photography at Art Center, Everard Williams. One of the things that I think, you know, that I try and encourage, and I know many of my fellow instructors try and encourage, is, is that element of play, right? Curiosity, right? So you start with curiosity, then you play a little bit, and then you, then you execute. And, and, and you can learn how to do it on demand so that um, if someone asks you to do it, you can go, oh, no, not a problem. You want to do that next Tuesday? I'm, I'm, I'm good. And, and you bring all the necessary pieces so that you're, not, you're guaranteed of not failing, right? You have backup for the backup and all those, all those kinds of things so that you're not left kind of hanging and leaving the client. The rest of my conversation with Everard can be found on our archives at justagoodconversation.com. Let's take a quick break from my sponsor or diving into my conversation with Jason Halley. I did it. Uh, you know, I mean, I had a degree in, in um, I mean, media arts, design, technology, but I did, I worked on the newspaper at my university here at Chico State, uh, where now I work. And journalism was always my direction. I always thought it would be in journalism. And this opportunity uh, came up and was brought to my attention. And, and I, you know, once I thought about it, I was like, oh, well, yeah, of course, of course, the universities has to have a photographer for all the events and all the, you know, needs and all the marketing that they would have going on. But beforehand, I, I just never even thought about it. Um, and so it's opened up, you know, so many different avenues of realizing, you know, where these little pockets of career uh, pathways with photography can be. Uh, which is really great. You know, when I get to talk with students, you know, they come in, they just like taking photos and I'm able to kind of try to have them think differently as far as, you know, where these opportunities could open up for them to explore photography as a career, you know, giving them the, the example that I had no clue that a university photographer job existed and could provide a career that it's given me. You never know where, if you love doing theater photography, that could be a career for you, you right? Know? And so they get really excited about that uh, because when we think about photography jobs, we think about the wedding photographer, the commercial photographer, the landscape photographer, these real big generalized, you know, fields. We don't think about those real stable career paths in very niche markets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, think about so, it. Our job's not going to be relocated. It's not going mm-hmm. out of business. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like those are the two biggest things that you always worry about when you are at a job. Like, do they get acquired and then do they, they cut everybody right. or are they going to get downsized? Like every newspaper in America, like right. the university is not moving to Philadelphia. Right. right? <laughs> and and right. they're not just going to close up shop and decide that they don't want images anymore. Well, and, and honestly, when I first came to the university, so I came from a newspaper background and I served this County uh, and I was coming to a campus and I thought in my mind, am I going to have enough to cover here? Because I've gone, you know, kind of reduced my coverage area down to 10 percent right. physically of the physical right. space. Yet my workload increased about tenfold. Uh, there's just so much that a university has a need for with photography. And, you know, I'm I have a hard enough time just keeping up with the work. So, yeah, as far as stability in this role, I mean, the demand is very, very high. Um, and I'm given a lot of freedom and the creativity of what I get to do. So, uh, it certainly is, is exciting. Um, and like I said, that kind of dream job I didn't realize was even here. Yeah. I mean, they're little cities, right? They got yep. police, oh, yeah. they got police forces and generations and power plants and people coming and going and they revolve every four years. You get new people coming mm-hmm. and going, professors come and go. It's, it's a city. Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's a really great thing. Uh, you know, with that kind of turnover with our students that come in and come out is anyone who you may be like frustrated by, or there's some anguish or some anxiety, or, you know, uh, there's an issue that comes apart, just be patient. And that kind of cohort will cycle out, you know, and you'll get a fresh group of students that come in who that old picture that you always take, and you're tired of taking it, it's new to them. 
Right. So you can take a picture of the, the main building of your, your campus again that you've taken a thousand times and everyone else on staff is sick of it because they've seen it every day. But to the new group of students, it's the best picture they ever seen. So it's kind of fun that you get this kind of refresh, you know, every four or five years that makes the work you do just like, all right, everyone's seeing it for the first time again. This is great. Did you grow up in the area? I did. So I grew up here in Chico, uh, California. I wasn't born here, but I grew up here, uh, went to high school here. And then I'm an alum from the the university that I work for now at Chico State here and built my skills here, uh, met my you know now wife here. Um, and now the job is paying for my kids, uh, to, to be here. So, I mean, I, I owe everything to the college experience that I've, that I've had through Chico state. My um, God, you're through and through Chico, aren't you? I, it's pretty much, it's definitely my hometown as I consider it. And I mean, it's, I've, I've looked at other universities and campuses just to kind of see what it's like out there, but I have it really good here at Chico state, um, in the trust and, and value that the campus has given me. You know, I think it's it's ties into just my passion for for this place. You know, I don't see it as just a job. I mean, this is like a home to me. Right. Yeah. When did you move? When did you start growing up in the area? Were you a young guy before, uh, younger than ten, when you moved to Chico? Yeah, I was. Uh, I was a uh, four. Oh yeah. No, 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 I was six. It was a long time ago. I was yeah. Six. So you are really like you, you are Chico bleeding through the blood. You are that oh, yeah. kind of kid. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. When did you start to discover a creative side to you? So, uh, I mean, I've always been creative. I mean, I played with Legos and a, a building system called Connects, you know. Oh, yeah. Would always, you know, work with those those types of things. I was always drawing. I thought I wanted to be an architect at one time uh, in high school, but it was too, too technical, you know. Uh, I had everything had to be in the lines kind of a thing. And so that transferred me in high school to photography my senior year. And that's where um, I picked up a camera and, and my mom bought my first digital camera for me. And I was taking a thousand pictures a month. What and was it? What friend, camera? Uh, it was a Sony, um, I forget the name of it, but it was like an FCS7 or something. It was okay. this like barrel lens with an articulating <laughs> screen on the back, five megapixel, you know, like the screen screen was like an inch and a half i still have it here in uh, our studio here you kept oh yeah it. i keep i keep all this stuff oh yeah and uh, don't tell me if it turns on it probably doesn't but uh but it's you know it has you know tape on it you know obviously things fall apart to it and sure. everything but uh was taking about a thousand pictures a month of friends and and then um everything what we did and i enjoyed it i enjoyed what the camera you know where it took me i mean as i say now it's like the camera's my passport with that camera i get to go places and see things and walk into spaces and rooms and what's happening over here and the camera kind of allows me to kind of be that you know key to open those doors up for me and so that's what i was able to discover when i was in high school you know we'd go well let's go over here and i'll take pictures of it and um from from there is when i kind of transferred over here to, to chico state for my undergrad and I was looking for a job. Um, there was an opening for a photographer for the student newspaper, the Orion here on campus. And I was like, well, I, I need a job. I got to pay, you know, car insurance. And so I, I applied for it. I realized it didn't pay. However, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Did you and have any idea what it would cur curtail? No, other than just what my assumptions of, oh, you need a photographer taking photos for the newspaper. I've taken photos in my high school class, so let me apply for it. Okay. But when I got into it and I realized, you know, the work was, you know, hey, here's a speaker here. Here's a person you'll meet. Here's an event happening. Here's, you know, these things going on. Here's sports that are going. It, it was just, it was just fun. Like there was just something about it that was enjoyable, you know, that everything else felt like work where the photography felt like, well, I get to see all these places, you know, this is, you know, Yes, I'll totally go there. Oh, I get to go on that behind that show, behind the scenes for for free. Absolutely, yeah. Everyone in the audience is paying to be here, and I got to go behind the scenes and meet the artists. You know, right. doing the concert right. at night. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, it was hard for me to walk away from that. Um, and I realized, you know, in my experience doing the working at the school newspaper, the idea of being a, a photojournalist is where that started to cement. And well, I didn't uh, pursue journalism uh, as a as a major or even a minor, um, 
I just knew because the experience of working in the newspaper was, you know, earning that, that enough. But, but I mean, were you I hooked spent, by that uh, first semester? Were you hooked? Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was hooked on photography when I first picked up that camera. I mean, there was just no letting it go. Um, but yeah, when I became, when I started doing photojournalism, that was definitely the, like the type of photography that I really enjoyed. Okay. Um, mostly because being a photojournalist, it, the diversity of what you got to do, you know, the idea of doing weddings, not only a stress, but even portraits, you know, felt monotonous of photographing the same thing again and again and again. But being a photojournalist, any, any given day, I was like at an athletics game, you know, meeting an interesting person, hearing about a special topic, being in a class, learning about a program, you know, having incidents happen, you know, in a, in a news realm that, you know, we were reporting and responding to. Uh, so it gave me a lot of that freedom, you know, in my role that I could be present and all these things. And I didn't have to be approved per se in the sense of, you know, well, well why are you here? You know, I was there to cover a story. Um, the storytelling was definitely the the bigger as time moved on and I realized the impacts of stories, the impacts of those photographs right. um, that grew as, as I further got along to, to the career. Um, but I spent in my undergrad work two the two and a half years uh, I talked with our local newspaper here in town uh, about, you know, who I was and I'd see their photographers out at assignments that we were kind of, you know, similarly uh, at the same place. And, we just chat it up, just say, yeah, how's it going? How's it doing? Hey, nice to meet you again, Bill. Great to meet you. Hey, Ty, how you doing? And, you know, got on a first name basis and an opportunity came up to work at the local newspaper. And, you know, they said you should apply. And I was like, okay, yes, definitely. Absolutely. And I did. I hadn't graduated yet, but they took a chance with me and said, we'll give you a job. We'll get you started. And, and, you know, you, we can, we can make it work. Really? And that's what started. Oh wow. yeah, and that's what started my um, that photo editor time. Bill Husa was the one who who fought for me to to join the the paper, and that's what started my tenure working as a photojournalist for the local uh, newspaper here in Chico, the Chico Enterprise Record. What um, did uh, what did that young Jason's portfolio look like? Terrible. It was awful. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, maybe there's a picture in there that I still am fond of. That's like, you know, that's not bad. Which one is that? What do you think um, it was? I couldn't even, I think, I think I can recall in my head. It was a, a photo we took of a, if I recall it, um, I haven't looked at the portfolio in a long time, but if I recall it, it was a, I used an underwater camera to photograph. Uh, and at the time it was, it was a swimmer, Haley Cope, who was swimming at a local pool, had been in the Olympics and I had an underwater camera. And so there's a photo where she's almost touching the end of the pool, going to flip. And you can kind of see the sun shining above because it's going you know, straight down looking up. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a nice composition, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but beyond that, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's terrible. It's, you know, it's just, yeah. It's, I mean, all of the photos we look back on, you know, you're just like, I'm so glad I'm growing. Yeah. It, it, it really tells you how important a photo editor is that they can look at your book young and say, I see potential here. Where you yeah. look at it and think, like, I got this all figured out. And he's like, <laughs> right. well, you really don't, but I'm not going to embarrass you and tell you that <laughs> we can work right. on it. But that's the, that's the great thing about a photo editor is seeing those things. Well, and, it, and it's, I, you know, one of the strengths of individuals, especially within photography, is that pursuit, their passion pursuit. I feel like in photography, someone has to be tremendously passionate about what they're pursuing and where they're headed. Because if not, you know, they're not going to push themselves to go, you know, later into the evening or to go out when it's stormy and the weather, you know, is dramatic, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to do everything that's very comfortable. And so you need someone that's motivated by passion because you can't teach that you can't right. train that. And, you know, for me, I had that kind of like that, you know, continued, you know, pursuit, just constant of like, all right, let's try this. Let's try this. Okay. I'm going to go here. I want to try this. I want to see this. I'm curious, you know? And um, I think that's what allowed me to continue improving and to continue to get better. Um, you know, and, and my always biggest fear of what I do is to just stay stagnant in my work, oh, you know, yeah. uh, and, and, and know that, you know, there are times where I'll enjoy the comfort, but if I'm doing the same type of work I did the year before, 
well, I'm not, I'm doing it wrong. You know, I, I need to find out different ways, you know, not dramatically change up everything, but, you know, make small efforts to, to add or grow or expand or become more intentional about the choices that I make with my work. Yeah, absolutely. So how were those first couple of months at the paper now? You're, you're quote unquote, a professional working at a newspaper. How was that? Well, I mean, as a young professional, it was the best thing ever. You know, I loved it. You know, I mean, it was like, you know. How that, big was the staff? So the staff, when I started, um, I believe the staff had a good, maybe I would say like good 12 reporters. Okay. Uh, it was a decent size for our our, our city. Um, since then, I think, honestly, I think they're down to three. Okay, so how um, big was, what year is this? So this is, this would be, you know, always gap a 10 year gap here, but this would have been uh 2004. Okay. I'm okay. sorry, 2005. It would have been t- t- 2005. How big was the circulation of the paper back then? What do you think? Uh, if I can recall some numbers in that range, um, the circulation would have been somewhere around 30,000. Okay. I think. All right. Yeah. So then how um, big was the photo department? So there was, there was three of us staff. Okay. There was a photo editor, right? Uh, Bill hired me. Um, uh, another photographer, Ty Barber, and then myself who joined in. Okay, and you guys just went to town and owned that valley. Yeah, we covered our our county, Butte County, here in Northern California, right. and we covered everything. Um, you know, we I mean, we typically had I would say probably two to three as- assignments a day, right? When we first started, but I worked there for nine years uh, oh, as a photo journalist. Um, and, and, you know, slowly through that time, you know, it started to deteriorate right. and what we'd have reporters who would leave and we wouldn't fill the position, mm-hmm. you know, and it got down to like every time someone left, I was always like, I don't know how we're going to work with one less person. Like we have every beat covered, like how are we going to work with one less? And then we'd have, you know, next year, two less. Well, I don't know how we're going to work with two less now. How is this going to work any more or less? We've have everything we can double beaded cover. How are we going to do that? And then another one would leave and we wouldn't replace it. And so it just... You know, I mean, I knew that was coming. Um, and so uh, really back in, I think it was, it was, I started in 20, 2005 and then back in uh, probably 2009, I, I had, well, through that time I had been exploring like, okay, where does this career take me? You know, like looking in photojournalism. So I looked at larger newspapers. I looked at, you know, Sacramento Bee. I spent some a week out in uh, covering the Democratic National Convention in 2008 uh, for the Denver Post, exploring what it looked like there, talking with the photographers, looking at the work, seeing what life would be like if I could, you know, work hard enough to move up in that level. Mm-hmm. And after talking with them, and they were phenomenal, they were great, and they were really welcoming to me, and it was awesome. But I realized it's not where I wanted to end up. Uh, I knew that to be that dedicated to do that well in those realms, um, it would it would dedicate a lot more time to the projects and the assignments that I wanted to dedicate to a family. So for me, I and my wife at the time, we made the choice for me to pursue a master's of fine arts degree uh, at the Academy of Art in San Francisco. Um, honestly, the, the reasoning of that, you know, we looked at Brooks Institute, you know, which has now kind of gone under at this point. Uh-huh. Uh, there was another institute uh, that we had looked at that offered an MFA. I looked at Chico State, in fact, for a master's degree. Uh, we didn't really have one uh, that would fit the photography uh, education that I wanted okay. to pursue. Sure. Um, so the Academy of Art offered, you know, the, the most reasonable, you know, effort for me to pursue because I was accepted into that program. With Brooks, they didn't accept me. They said, you'd have to take some undergrad classes before getting into the program. And I said, well, if I'm going to pay for the undergrad and still not know if I'm in the program or not. Let me just do the Academy of Art and just run that whole program. Right. Um, right. So I, I realized that moving upward through journalism, through newspapers and the industry wasn't the pathway I wanted to take. I decided I wanted to pursue the education. Um, you know, and I had, uh, Was that what you were thinking? You know, like if you get your master's, maybe you'll teach and go that way. So, that was the original intent for okay. me pursuing the master's was to utilize it to teach. And that was the reason I pursued not just a master's, but a master's of fine arts. Right. Because that offered me a terminal degree for, uh, um, for what I would receive there to be able to teach, you mm-hmm. know, uh, you know, and, and be a little bit more stable in that realm. And I said, well, if I'm going to, you know, 
buy into education. I'll, 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 you know, buy the farm in a sense. Um, and so I've, I've drawn a little farm on my degree, you know, so that way it makes sense. Um, but, uh, it was, it was a good experience for me. I mean, I certainly am a very different photographer through that, that pathway. Um, I'm still paying on that student loan. Uh, <laughs> Chico state was much more affordable for me. I'm sure. Um, but it definitely, and as I, especially as, as I look at other photographers and I talk with other photographers and I talk about photography in general, there, there's no uh, doubt that the, the opportunity in education that I picked up from pursuing the Masters of Fine Arts in Photography has added a new level and layer that I couldn't receive online. Right. You know, I couldn't receive just looking up, you know, different pictures that I come across on the internet. So. Now, did you have to do the work at San Francisco? Was that going in on Monday to what, Thursday or whatever? Yeah. So I, you know, obviously when you're paying that much and pursuing that type of degree, I was like, okay. I got to be there as much as I can. Right. But right. I also can't afford to live in San Francisco and our family couldn't afford to move to San Francisco. Um, What's the so family I, look like at this point? Yeah. So my, uh, I was just married to my wife at this point okay. when we pursued, started to pursue it. Um, during my, my time at, uh, earning my degree, we did have our first son who was born. So my wife was a single mother during this time right. <laughs> uh, and very gracious of me to pursue this. Um, and then, and then work, working at the newspaper, the enterprise record, they, they allowed me to go down to four days of work week. Um, I still put in 40 hours just on those days that I ended up working. Like, you know, they weren't eight hour days, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but I did work four days. And what that did was it allowed me to have Monday and Tuesday to go down to San Francisco, drive down from Chico, which is about a three hour drive, drive down every week, drive down there in San Francisco. The first year I stayed with a friend in the Presidio, which was great. It was, Presidio is awesome in San Francisco. Sure. And then, uh, and he allowed me crash on his couch. And then uh, the next uh, two and a half years, uh, cause he moved out of Presidio. Uh, so the next two and a half years, I crashed with my cousin on his couch. Uh, my cousin was uh, in medical school down there. And so uh, basically I just roll in at like 11 o'clock on a Monday night sleep for about five hours and wake up and get back into the city for, for classes that I would take in person Monday, Tuesday. So I did the best that I could scheduling my, um, my coursework in person Monday, Tuesday in San Francisco. And then some classes I had to take online just because the schedule didn't work out that way. Mm -hmm. but my week basically looked like I would wake up Monday at 3am drive down to San Francisco for three hours only to beat traffic really. Right. Because even if I was in traffic for an hour, yeah, it was just, oh, I couldn't take it. So I, I would get in San Francisco, you know, about a uh, little before seven or, you know, 6.30 or so. And uh, I'd get early bird parking, which helped, you know, cost wise. And then I'd go to classes all day, Monday, again, crash on my cousin's couch Monday night, wake up super early to get early bird parking back in the city and then uh, go to classes all day Tuesday. And then depending on when my classes were, because again, trying to beat traffic out of the bay, I would either try and get on the road, you know, right before three, or I would stay until nine. And then, you know, sometimes I get back, you know, 11, whatever. So then that was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I forced myself to sleep in because I would just be so exhausted. And I tried waking up early Wednesday, didn't work, uh, you know, but then Wednesday I would go to work uh, from Wednesday and I worked the night shifts. So I did 12 to nine typically shifts Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then I also worked Saturday. Well, then Sunday came around and I, uh, Sunday was my, um, you know, could do all the homework and all the projects for the coursework that I needed to finish and then get all the studies done. And then, oh yeah, I'm still married. So I got to make sure my wife is happy. <laughs> Hi, you how know, are you? Sure I'm Jason. <laughs> all the chores are done and everything's done. And, um, and again, when we also had our son born too, I also had to, you know, ensure that everything was done there. And, and everyone just goes, I can't believe you did that for three and a half years. That's crazy. And I was like, like, how did you drive down Cisco, San Francisco every week? And I was like, honestly, I was so busy during the week of, of you know, working and, and photographing and projects and this and that and everything in between that, honestly, the car drive for three hours, just sitting and listening to a podcast or sitting in my own thoughts was kind of refreshing. Yeah. And it allowed me that time to kind of, you know, clear my head because I couldn't, couldn't work on a project, couldn't talk to a teacher, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. It was just me in a car and my thoughts. So it was really clearing uh, for my mind just to kind of process everything for the week. Um, and I, I even got to a point where even after that, there'd be moments where I'm like, I've, I've just have a lot on my mind. And I'm like, I, I got to take a three hour drive. I got to, I got to go around. I'm going to drive for a bit. I just got to clear my head, you know, and my wife knows that about me now. So she's like, okay, well, we'll see you later then. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was good to do that uh, 20 years ago. To do that now would be very costly. <laughs> it, it would be, yeah. yeah. It would be. I definitely uh, appreciate having a Honda Civic at least through that time that kind of rolled me through there, uh, not having the, the $6 gas you oh, know, cost. Yeah. Whew. So... I'm I'm guessing at this time you're you've got to be looking around watching the paper deteriorate. Yeah. Um and and again like I said, you know, even at this time, even though I did pursue a, a degree in a master's of fine arts and I had intended to do that to teach. Right. Teaching still was very supplementary to me. Sure. I still thought I would be at the paper and then happen to teach a couple of classes and then the, between the two would give me a stable career. Right. Um right. And, and again, teaching was, was a big component of what I you know, wanted to pursue and enjoyed it uh, and felt like I could. And so when I was kind of getting uh, to finish up the degree, uh, and this would have been um, December of 2013, um, I was like, okay. And, and I started actually talking with some of the faculty and departments here on uh, Chico State's campus, because obviously I was from Chico, the campus is here in town. It was the most immediate, you know, place to kind of uh, reach out to. Mm -hmm. But my wife and I had also talked about exploring different regions. You know, would we go down to San Francisco? Would we go to other, you know, states even? We didn't really know. We were just going to open ourselves now to a new opportunity that I'd achieved this degree. So in that December of 2013, was the uh, the same time frame that uh, I was approached about this position as a working university photographer for Chico State, and was like, oh, oh yeah, 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 oh this is amazing, absolutely. Um, was there and, somebody before you? So there technically was somebody before me, um, but that person was two things they had retired and then the director at that time was like oh everybody has a cell phone we don't need to pay a photographer we'll just have everyone photograph on their phone and if we have a student for a big important thing we'll use a student photographer so it built this hiatus of about i think i don't know it specifically but like five to six years without a university photographer and it was just students who would come in and, and do the work uh, the role of that that job so there was a, a push uh for to, to bring back a university staff photographer position. And I had people actually approach me about doing that. And I, I told them, I was like, I would love to work for Chico state, but I would need a full-time job of stability. I can't moonlight. Right. I'm already working nights as it is. You know, I need something that's, that's sustainable. So they're like, okay, okay, okay. okay. So it took about three years to open that position up and it timed in with that opening up for me, finishing up my degree and so I applied for it. I was fortunate to get to it. As one of my good friends here who's on staff reminds me from time to time, I was actually not the first choice in this position. Wow. Um, there was another person who was uh, being looked at um, that had a lot more experience. But I, I've been kind of told that one of the main decisions that wasn't they weren't selected was because they came in with a bit of an ego uh, about what this position was offering. It was a little beneath them, right? Because again, you haven't had a photographer in this role for six years. Right. A lot of the equipment resources didn't exist here, mm -hmm. you know? So they came in from other places, you know, thinking, well, that's not going to work and really was dismissive of what the opportunity that was being presented to them, where I came in still relatively young as far as experience. I mean, never been a university photographer. So I came in with an experience going, Oh, this would be great. I'm happy to do whatever you need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, yeah, that's good. Yeah. You've worked and at one that, newspaper, so yep. you don't know what four or five newspapers would have looked like throughout your career. So this second mm -hmm. job to you, you're like, ha, baby, you look fantastic. Right. <laughs> right. But that flexibility was a direct contrast to someone else who was probably more skilled at the role. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but again, a lot of times when I tell a lot of students who come through in their career paths, sometimes it's not necessarily hiring the best person. A lot of times it's hiring the best person for the job. Right. And that can look very different. So, and that was the same thing of my experience when I got hired at the Enterprise Record. There was a lot of other photographers, photojournalists who probably had years of experience who would have been phenomenal, but they may not have been best for that job and working with those staff that I had the fortune of working with. And, you know, I was given a lot of uh, that opportunity to jump into that position, as well as this position now at Chico State here, that I came in. And again, when I came into this role here, 
basically I realized the the value of this job, what it was, you know, again, that, that this is the dream job. Oh my gosh, this is the secret dream job. I can't believe this is a, a job that I can have. I'll take it. Absolutely. And at that point I wanted to do nothing that would jeopardize it. So those teaching opportunities that I had started conversations on, you know, they came back going, all right, we're going to talk about this. What do you think about this? I was like, well, I just was got this job working as the staff for the campus. So I think I'm going to have to focus on this priority first. However, I do know a guy. So let me get you in touch with them. You know, that'll be great for what your needs are. So I, you know, didn't leave them high and dry because obviously I'm working on the same campus. I may interact with them again, but, uh, you know, it's a small campus and it's a small world. And, uh, but the reality was that I, I didn't want to lose this uh, position. And so I dwelled everything into making this, this role, serve this campus and the needs of this campus in a way that everybody would see that value of the investment to have a staff person, because that was the argument of like, well, why don't we have students do this? You know, why would we need a staff person? Um, And so that's kind of what's when you're, when you're thinking about taking this university job and you look back at that, what did you say? Nine years when you were at the newspaper? I, I worked for the newspaper for nine years. Yeah. How was your growth in those nine years that kind of set you to be ready for this university job? You know, young Jason to nine years into it, Jason. Yeah, I think, I think the growth, the skill development is really the biggest growth that I took um, from working at a newspaper because you, you had the the diversity of what you photographed. um, You weren't niched into any specialty. You know, I wasn't like I was a phenomenal portrait photographer. Man, I couldn't be matched with that. I had to be a good portrait photographer. I had to be a good news photographer, spot news photographer. Right. I had to be a good feature photographer, sports photographer, night photographer, any photographer. I had, be, I had to be a good generalist. Right. And that skill development to have me be good at many things prepared me for the role that I serve here on the campus, that to be successful in this job, I have to be good at many things. Isn't that surprising? Uh, I bet young Jason wouldn't even have thought that. Well, it, it, it is very counterintuitive to a lot of suggestions that people will make to artists that they say, find a niche and, and dwell deep. Right. You know, develop your craft and become, you know, a perfectionist at it. And that will bring you success. And, and that is true. I, I do agree to that to an extent. Yet then I am, though, the example of the antithesis of that, that I haven't necessarily dwelled great into one thing, but I've brought, I've been broadly good at most things. And that has served really successful in my pursuits. Um, so, you know, there's benefits to both routes. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it, it really, it doesn't necessarily matter. It's just, it depends on the pathway that you want to take towards those things. Right. What did you think in those nine years that like your process, right? I'm a big process guy and how people, get better, whether it's in a portrait or they walk into to shoot like a food shoot or an event and they can process it quickly and go into their mind Rolodex and be like, okay, I got to get that guy, that guy, that guy. The light's going to be good here, here, here. Was that process for you in those nine years a quick growth or did you take those nine years to just get a lot better? No, I don't think about process at all, man. I just don't even, (laughs) I'm not even thinking about it right now, you know? (laughs) No, (laughs) Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, for me, like, and, and, I, and I've started owning this statement a little bit more. I don't offer f- photographs. I offer experiences. So in me, it's not so much like the, like a lot of photographers chase that photograph. It has to be perfect. Everything has to be technically sound. To me, it's how the individuals that I've captured feel how they feel in my presence and what I've taken from there as far as the photograph. And I didn't realize this was true when I was a photojournalist because I was just doing a job and I just kind of jumped in and hoped for the best, right? But now that I've had this role as a university photographer where I have a lot more intentionality and control of the type of things I photograph, even with that control, my main process is just to ensure that the people I'm working with are left with an experience that goes, wow, that was great. Because that will inform them of the picture they see, that they go like, nah, it's great. I loved it. That was a fun time that we had. They look fondly upon the experience. So the process that I take, yes, there's technical kind of, you know, making sure this has that, we have that, this is prepared for that, we have this. But it always comes down to the experience and the interactions I have with the subjects and the individuals that I'm working with, ensuring that 
they've had an enjoyable time of this effort so that when they I leave, they're left with, that was great. That was awesome. And usually that has allowed me to be, to earn their trust, you know, in the work that I do. Right. Because it's funny when, when we work at a paper, we might only see that subject once. Right. right. You go in and do homecoming queen or mayor or whatever. Off you go. Even in a, even in a county, the Butte, it's not 40 million people. It's, but you might not ever see that person again. On campus, mm -hmm. you could see them at the lunch line. You could see them at the next event. You can be in a Zoom meeting with them or whatever. There's 16,000 people all of a sudden. That's a lot. Not that many people. You really see a lot of people. So, yeah, your experience sure. with one can be repetitive with the next person. Oh, absolutely. And, and again, that's why I think it's really important for individuals to have that positive experience because, you know, I mean, we're very familiar with the cameras, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, let me ask you, when you have your picture taken, isn't there a certain discomfort with your photograph being taken of yourself? I'm Just over that. that I'm more side. worried about, are they, are they using the right focal length? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and that's, but that's, you know, there's a certain level of like, right. Okay, you have now given your trust to somebody else, yes. to create, you know, and so the way that I see it is that the subjects that I'm photographing here on this campus, they're giving me trust mm -hmm. to ensure that they're taken care of and they look a certain way and are portrayed a certain way. So I can easily look at these photos and be like, you know, none of this matters. You know, yeah, it's a headshot. It's, you know, it runs like right. an inch by an inch on a website. Nobody's going to see it. Nobody's going to see these things. These things don't matter. And I could not take it seriously, but I do have to remind myself that, to them, this is their identity for 10 years. Right. You know, at least they'll come in thinking that, you know, because they won't. I mean, I always tell everybody, you're welcome to come back. If you came right. in for a headshot and you're, you know, you step away and you're like, oh, why did I wear that green color? Oh, uh, come back on. We'll do it again. Yeah. Make sure you're happy. Yeah. The idea, though, is that they feel that that becomes their identity for 10 years. And so you do have to take it seriously. Yes. That. Yeah. You know, you want to make sure that they enjoy the experience so that whatever the photo looks like, that they appreciate it and they value that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how you run your headshots. We, you know, start here at Dominguez. I, we did five in three months just to get as many people as we could. And we almost did 600 people. They hadn't had them in so long. Mm. And I was treating each one like it was a Vanity Fair set. So like I had a lint brush and I had a steam, like I, and so I'm brushing people up and coming here and they were stunned at that kind of attention because mm -hmm. either previously or any other headshot, it was like, you know, everybody just thinks of the DMV stand there, mm -hmm. shut up. I take a picture. You look miserable <laughs> and off you mm -hmm. go comrade. Like that was it. But if yeah. you give your subject, that kind of attention. The next time you call upon them, they'll do whatever you want because they had a great experience. Absolutely. Well, and, and I've learned that, you know, value is in the details, right? So mm -hmm. if you go and you're, you, you just want to, hey, I just want to buy a hamburger, right? A hamburger is going to cost you, you know, what? Nowadays, probably what? Five bucks, say, right. for a hamburger, right? right? But if you go and, and you want to have a sirloin steak, charred, you know, flame broiled with a sauce, you know, sauteed on, uh, you know, fried onions, you know, like you start detailing out what this is, someone's going to probably go like, oh, well, yeah, I'll pay 20 bucks for that. Sure. And it could be the same, it could be the same hamburger. Right. You know, probably could even maybe even be a worse hamburger than the, you know, grease stain one, you know, that's cheaper. But the idea is that people put value in details. So in the work that I do, you know, I mean, obviously I'm authentic to it, but I, I give that detail consideration. You know, I take that second look, I take a moment to be like, yes, everything's good. And and you do, you have people who go, oh, thanks for noticing that. I really appreciate that. And, you know, the change you did is fairly negligent to the overall, you know, moment right. because you took that time and detail, you've put in that value that now you're actually noticing these things that others, you know, skim through and, and don't value. Right. What was that first week like? being a university photographer well, well so coming from newspapers <laughs> and working at a state system with state benefits and on this campus and having resources and even having a large studio environment that i worked in i mean i was it was like in heaven you know uh and it, you know it, it's just one of those things where it's like from this campus from day one um 
I, in my role here, have been given a tremendous amount of support, um, both from a resource component, um, but also from a trust uh, aspect, too. And that's not, and not that it wasn't wanted to be given, you know, at at, uh, newspapers, but Mm -hmm. obviously, you know, the resources for newspapers, you know, became very thin. And so to kind <laughs> that's of being polite, this, yeah, <laughs> to open up to this. Well, yeah, I try to be polite, you know, I mean, they did, did develop the skill sets to get me where I hear I am here, you know, they that's did true. Give me opportunity. so I can't, I can't look negatively or disgruntled towards, you know, my path because right. it's brought me right. here, but certainly, you know, to kind of now come to this, what felt like a overwhelmingly supportive, you know, area, you know, you do, you feel like, Oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever, oh. you know, because, you know, I almost struggle and, and I had a, a really good um, director who uh, has since retired, but, you know, his, one of his big, you know, leadership changing moments that he had told me at one time, I came in for talking about something and he kind of cut me off and was like, Jason, 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 you have to understand my job. I work for you. And it flipped the whole idea of a boss and what they're supposed to mean for me. Because my mindsets were the bosses always saying, hey, hey, you go do this. I got to have you do this. They need to do this. Get this done. I get this. Come on, come on, go, 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 go. And it's, I was working for them. Mm -hmm. And my director had basically flipped that 180 going, no, 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 no. I work for you. My job is to ensure you have everything you need and you have everything you want to have. So when I started here, you know, I'd get emails and questions and I'm new to this whole world. So I'd have stuff that came in where I'm like, I don't, I don't know what our answer is for this. I don't know what we're supposed to do in this, this level. So let me go ask my director. So I go there and I'd be like, Hey, so what do you think? What do you think about this? What, what should be my answer there? And uh, my director would be like, well, well, what do you think we should do? And I was like, uh, well, I, uh, I mean, you're, you're my boss. You should tell me what to do. I don't know. Uh, okay. I guess I'll get back to you. I'll let you know. And at first it was, a, it was, weird because I was like, you're the boss. You tell me what to do. But I realized that, no, he worked for me. He wanted me to make the best decision of what I thought was best for the role that I would be doing in the, you know, department that I'd be serving. Right. So once I figured that out, then I was like, oh yeah, no, this is, I think we should pursue this. And he was always supportive always worked to ensure that we had that uh, needs and, and met. And I would go to him with requests and be like, oh, I'm really asking for a lot here. I mean, it's these new lights. I mean, they're really nice, but oh, they're pretty expensive. And he had come in and be like, I'd send him an email and say, yeah, are these okay. And then I immediately go to his office going, okay, let me explain what I'm asking for here. So you understand it. And he'd be like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, the, the cost, you know, is this. And he's like, oh, no, 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 that's fine. I want you to spend a little bit more, twice as much on a new camera equipment system for you. So you, you're updated with your cameras because those are getting old. And I'm like, uh, oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, sure. Yes. I'll go back and figure out more. I mean, were you driving home, scratching your head going, oh my God, I can't believe this is real. I mean, to this day, I still find it unbelievable that I'm in a role like this, that I get to be where I'm at. And, and I understand that that's not, uh, every, not every university photographer is set up in the way that I am. Right. Like I've had opportunities to meet other university photographers who are overworked and who are, you know, asked of a lot and who are not given the resources to do the job that they do. Um, so I know that my experience is not universal. Uh, you know, I'm definitely privileged here, but I'm grateful for that because, you know, Chico State, has saw the value of what a university photographer can be. And I'm just trying to, to keep up with what they feel I can grow to. Um, you know, they, they still think there's more that I can become. And I'm like, Oh, okay. I thought I was at the best part. Okay. There's, you're saying there's better. Right. All right. I'll think about that. You know? Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting how we're all, all university photographers are set up a little differently. And, you know, but it really does come down to having great bosses that get it, Mm -hmm. that understand your role. Don't figure out, well, just go out and take a picture. No, go out and make a picture. What do you need to go make that picture? And then we're only going to go make those pictures if they actually have long legs for the university. We're not going to go out Mm -hmm. and take pictures of every group just because they need a photo taken. And so that Mm -hmm. makes a huge difference is having quality people above you understanding what you do. Right. Right. Well, and honestly, so I still do a lot of the groups. 
a lot of the events, yeah. a lot of the ceremonies, a lot of the things that other photographers are like, oh, we need to focus more on these other, uh, you know, other more creative efforts. Again, because it's about the experiences. Right. Um, and for me, you know, personally, I have no problem saying no. I have two kids now and a wife and family and everything. And I got to be home, you know. I like being at home. Yeah. And I have personally no problem to say, nope, can't do that. Busy. Not going to do it. But I also feel that my role as a university photographer, if I say no to the requests and needs of these departments, however big or small they are, in turn, it's effectively the university that says, yeah, that program or that student or those staff, that's not important. We we don't need to see that. It's not important to cover that. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's, I don't want to be at that point yet. You right. know, I, I feel like, no, if we're doing these things with students, you know, even if it's one student who makes an impact, it should, it should be noted. It should be documented. It should be a part of the, you know, university's history to be categorized as like, this is what we've done for, for our students. And if there's a request that comes in that says, we would love to feature this or have this be captured as my role as a university photographer, I want to be able to support that. Right. Uh, so. so what, tell me what your day to day is like. Cause you know that, you know, you didn't know, I didn't know what a university photographer does. And it's a little different than maybe it was 15 years ago, 10 years ago, but what does your day to day look like? Yeah. The day to day is, is different uh, and it's never predictable. And even as my calendar is full of assignments and things to do and tasks that could all change in any given day. Um, you know, we, we, in fact, yesterday, uh, or uh, now, yeah, two days ago, two days ago, it's been a long week, two days ago, we had our university president announce her retirement plans for the end of uh, June, 2023. I saw that. Yeah. Well, that, that changed everything, you know, cause now, <laughs> okay, well now I got to you know document the response of, you know, impacts of the campus and what people are feeling or maybe there's something, maybe there's not, or now I'm just curious my own self. Cause now I gotta go talk and be like, wait, what's going on? What's happening? What's this stuff? And, so that gets added on to what I did have planned. So day to day, you know, I, I come in, I have a calendar of stuff. There's assignments, uh, you know, that people have requested. Um, but if I have like a half hour in the morning and I'm like walking in going, ooh, that night light coming in, that looks really nice. I'm going to go see it. I'll grab a camera, walk out for just 10 minutes, you know, get just an updated photo, bring it back. Cause that's just, you know, fulfills my own need, you know, for what I want. Right. And then I'll do the assignment. Um, I get a lot of emails. Like everybody <laughs> gets a lot of emails. Um, so I got to respond to those at times. Um, and then it's, if I get a chance to edit, I'll edit some of the photos that I do. Um, you know, we have different seasons through the year. So some seasons are a little bit more busy where it's just go, 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 go. What are these seasons you talk of? <laughs> well, I, I have yeah, first of all, I actually have, actual like weather seasons yes so we do you know rain and summer heat and fall your, weather and your trees and change color i have do. no idea yeah. what that is yeah so we actually have physical seasons um but then with that also comes like workload seasons yeah, that's you true. know so there's like a routine of the campus where you know we kind of start off like this you know fast start in august with just events and welcome backs and move-ins and you know everyone's starting up and once that first week or two kind of falls off, there's a small little lull where everyone's kind of getting settled in. And that picks back up kind of mid-September through October as everyone tries to do all their events and all their kind of mid-semester, you know, programs and features and whatnot. And we're just trying to scram it all in before the basically the, the rains hit, um, which will basically start after October. So November, we'll get some rainy season that comes in. And then it kind of, you know, you know, slows down and, and you know, kind of uh, gets really slow through the December months. And then uh, our break in January, we're in a semester system. And I get excited thinking, okay, spring semester, let's get this start again. All right, we're going to start with a bang here. And it's slow. It's <laughs> like, oh, yeah, people came back today. Oh, yeah, okay. And it starts off really slow. And then all of a sudden, it picks up a little bit in February. And then March, we'll have spring break. And literally after spring break, it's a marathon run to commencement. And then as soon as basement commencement, it, it goes, it goes quiet. Right. Dormant. Know, so just yeah. hello, anybody on campus? Hello. Yeah. 
And, uh, um, he, how big is the community evolved in the university? Do you get a lot of people showing up to like sporting events or theater or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, our community is very tied in to this campus. Um, not only a lot of our alum were able to stay here in, in town, but our campus is immediately adjacent to the downtown area of the campus. Um, and a lot of our student housing is in is in the downtown area of our of our town. So it's very much tied into the experience of, of Chico State. And really, when people talk about, you know, when they graduated from Chico State, they kind of drop the state. They talk, they talk about like, oh, yeah, my time in Chico. Oh, yeah, I was up in Chico. Oh, yeah, I came from Chico. The, the, it, Chico as a town is very much an integral part of Chico State as an academic experience. Um, that being said, the town, like campus has its general, you know, kind of barriers, you know, where there's, you know, you don't park on campus. So it's hard to get to campus if you're off of it or have no reason to kind of come on come well, onto campus. It's the second oldest campus in California, right? Correct. 1890 Correct. something. 87. Yeah. So you rode yeah. your horse to school back then. You didn't, <laughs> you didn't yeah. drive. And so it's, but it's one of those things where, but you will on weekends, a lot of times you'll see people in town who went downtown, you know, had some breakfast and then kind of walk around campus. Um, so sometimes on the weekends, you'll see people in, in the town kind of be hanging out on campus and just, just enjoying through. it. You know? Yeah, it's walking a, through, just taking walks. It's a beautiful, yeah. stunning campus. It does not feel like it should be in California. It has that with that brickwork. It has a very East Coast feel. Well, I'm guessing you're just looking at my wonderful photographs because I don't think you've ever been here physically. I was there '91. Oh well, there you go. Yeah, that was the last time I was at Chico State. My parent or my grandparents lived up in Paradise, which doesn't exist much anymore, and right. they wanted to take me on a tour of Chico State. I don't know why. But we drove down Skyline and they showed me Chico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's changed a lot since then. Has it? Um, oh yeah, we have a lot more buildings. You know, the campus has gotten bigger. Um, I mean, there's still the the core of our campus is the same. You know, we have our old classic brick buildings and, and the trees and the, you know the nature is a big component of here. Beautiful. Uh, it's a beautiful yeah. campus. Oh. You know, and um, but but our kind of core values is the fact that we have that strong sense of community. You know, uh, both in our town, but then into the people of the communities that we have on this campus. Because we're not we're not a large campus in the sense of we don't have lecture halls of four or five hundred you know students. You know, that's mind boggling to me that other campuses are that size, oh. but they have to be. Yeah. And yeah. here, you know, our our largest uh, you know lecture hall, I think is, I think is only like one hundred and thirty seats. You know, it's it's not that big. Most of our class sizes, I think our average class size is around 36 or 32. So you you do have, you know, much more personable interactions with the faculty uh, and that sense of community where they know like what's what's happening, what you're, you know, working on, whatever. Wow. They can they can see you in the class and be like, Hey, is everything all right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> hey Gary, how yeah. is everything? Yeah, I mean they can right. literally see you. Right. How how big is commencement for you guys? Is it like just the planning for the Super Bowl? Um, I mean, I've never planned for a Super Bowl, but yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it is the Super Bowl of our campus. I mean, it's it's the culmination of all the hard work. Um, and we do we do our best to kind of like have our staff come out and volunteer and help out because it's kind of an all hands on deck. And I mean, I'm I have to because, um, you know, it's it's commencement. We got to cover this. Um but it's, it's so rewarding. I mean, because it's such that celebration of the hard work that everyone has put forward and it is enjoyable and it's a lot, it's a lot of work. Um, we immediately go from commencement into, we here at Chico state have summer hours. So we work four tens um, and we get Fridays off and everyone goes, Oh, 10 hours is so long. And I'm like, well, 10 hours is about five hours shorter than I've been working these last week. So I'll take it. <laughs> Uh, because for us, it becomes, yeah, these 15 hour days, you know, for that week. Um, yeah. and then, and then, and then I've had to actually take, um, the following, uh, week after commencement that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I have to basically lock myself in the, in my office to edit everything, you know? So I try and edit as I go, right. Edit, you know, as much as I can every night. Um, but then that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I have to finish it all because as you know when you take a picture everyone's like hey can i see that now and you're like 
well, I mean, I gotta go back and I gotta like put some keywords in it and caption info yeah. and you know, all this stuff in there. And I was like, yeah, I'll get it to you later. And so when I take, you know, 20,000 pictures over the five days, you know, and end up with about 3000 photos to be edited. Yeah. I mean, it, it takes some time, right? you know, and everyone else, you know, they go, they have a lot of work leading up uh, to the event. They get to enjoy the event. And then after they get to yeah, they, be like, ah, oh, we're done. done. All right. <laughs> hey, let's do some other stuff. Now my job is the reverse. You know, my job has very little lead in, you know, where I'm just like, all right, just tell me what's going on where you need to be. Yep. And the event I get to enjoy, but then after the event, my job begins. And that's very reversed to everybody else in normal situations. And so I, that's why I have to lock myself down. I put an away message on my you know, emails. I close the door. We are like, <laughs> we don't exist. Do not. I'm not talking to anybody. I have to get all these done. Right. Because so. it's a massive amount to edit through. People don't get it. Well, oh. and for our editing, uh, we, we, and this is the photojournalism background of myself, we get everybody's names that we feature that are subjects of the images, right? Large groups, we don't because they're large groups. But if they're a subject of our image, if they're individuals in the photos, we get their names. And wow. I know not every university photographer does that, but I do it because inevitably I will have that student who goes, hey, you took our picture, you know, and I can go, oh, okay, sure. I'm sure I did. What's, what's your name? And they'll tell me and I go, great. And I can put it in our system and I bring them up and I'll bring them up, not only commencement, but I'll bring them like, Oh, I met you freshman year at an event. Oh, I didn't realize that. And so that's the value of the work and time where it warrants, you know, spend that time on that because I can find those easily where if someone came to me, like you took our picture, you know, last year's commencement, I'd be like, uh, Hey, here's a 847 picture. Good luck. <laughs> you know, I, again, have, have you even like, thought of, I, I, I brought this up to them when I started in May and they all just kind of were like stunned. Have you even thought of AI captioning? So I have thought of it. Um, I know like BYU has looked into it, but they do a lot more athletics mm -hmm. um, and they've used it for AI doing that. There's, there's a little bit of a trust issue I have with AI, you know, cause like, I'm like, but how do you, how do you know it's that person or, you know, and um the idea of AI sounds great. Um, I haven't seen it in practice in the, in the type of work that I'm doing right. that, that it really would benefit it. But, but who's to say in five, six years, you know, we'll see. Um, I'm not necessarily opposed to it. The other concern that I do have or would be, you know, wanting to know about is just when you start needing to get into just certain kind of privacy issues. Right. So some I, AI would need to, you know, if it needs to scan faces or it pulls from a database of, you know, students, uh, images, you know, of their ID photos to cross reference it, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you get into privacy issues, I just don't want to dwell down to those things. You know, what, what I have works, you know, right. um, and, and I haven't seen at this time moment time, yeah, I don't know, but I haven't, I haven't seen the, the direct benefit for us using AI. Right. I, I've looked into it. I've talked to the people. We use it uh, for photo shelter, for athletics, for UC mm -hmm. Irvine that I work with. And I, I think within three to five years, it'll be something for us. Like it'll make commencement so easy because we could just start, you know, we could just shoot all those people and then boom, they're all done on the back end for us. And I will say there was one year that we took a bunch of the photos that I had uh, captured during commencement. And in the moment, uh, I was sending them to our social media uh, person just at, from my camera, you know, to my phone to, right. directly to that. And they they posted kind of these galleries immediately after the ceremonies and they posted it to Facebook. And well, everyone on Facebook tagged their friends. Right. So it was just funny, like, oh, like, oh, wow, that, oh, now I know that person now. Oh, yeah. great, because they were in a group. I didn't get their name, but now they're tagged. Oh, <laughs> oh that, that, wow, that really, that's really nice. See, I mean, they're um, doing so it I know for you. Yeah, I know that there is some some benefits to it. Um, I would just want to have that, that, you know, security, you know, that like, yes, it's, it's not going to cause more trouble or, you know, whatever. What so. do you guys use for an archiving system? So we use a program called Extensus Portfolio okay. uh, for a digital asset management system. Okay. So, that work for you well? You like it? It does. Um, it's it's a pretty internal system. Um, you know, it's not uh, fully open the way like Photoshelter for brands will do. And, mm -hmm. and 
Photo Shelter definitely has talked to me a lot. I've talked to them. They're fantastic. Um, we just haven't been able to kind of invest in into them at this point. Uh, and largely because for us, Extensus Portfolio works tremendously well for our needs and we don't really have any problems with it. So it's kind of one of those, it's harder to make an argument to leadership of like, right. hey, that thing that works perfectly well and is really cheap. Yeah, let's spend a lot more money on something else, but it gives us a lot more options. You know, it's it's harder to make and convince yeah. that. But one of these days, possibly, we'll we'll see as our our archive needs change. How many years now are you at Chico State? Uh, eight and a half. How are you dealing with the repetitiveness of like that? Every year, it's you know, it's like a calendar being on that swinging through it. As that and your and your creative process to not get numb. So I'll, I'll give you two kind of examples. The first one is effectively um, I've always, I've always had that repetitiveness. Um, and even in journalism, like you'd have seasons of fire season and football season, you know, come back up and you'd photograph those same things or the annual event, you know, the local Apple festival, you know, you'd photograph the same thing. So, but again, it wasn't every day for me, the repetitiveness is at least spread out enough you know, where I'm like, well, that's a fall semester event. So we'll just wait till next fall to do that one again, or even commencement. It's like, we do a commencement, but we do commencement every year. We don't do it every weekend. So I'm not too affected by it in that realm. Um, and again, having that refresh of the new students that come in again, to see that repetitive photo I may take, but appreciate it as new does help with the repetitiveness um, in that realm. But another example where I've kind of dug a hole out of the repetitiveness was my first year when I came in here, I had to photograph headshots of our new faculty that came in and there was like 47 new faculty and they came in and I did all their headshots and I did them all in a row. And I was like, Oh, that was so boring. Like just these headshots of these faculty, like that was just, there's a lot of them. Right. And then again, I'm talking 48, not the 600 you were mentioning earlier. That sounds even crazier to me. (laughs) But the following year, I was like, okay, I have another 46 new faculty to photograph. I do not want to photograph them just a headshot. That seems like such a waste of my time. So I was like, I'm going to do something a little different. So I photographed a headshot, and then I just asked them. I didn't tell anybody. I just asked them, hey, I'm going to take a portrait of you now, but I want you to just bring your hands into the picture. Just keep your hands in the frame. That's it. And let them do however, you know, up at their face, over their chin, over whatever. Like, just bring a hand in the picture. That's all I need which I did take directly from my experience in pursuing my master's of fine arts degree that uh, one of our faculty had done a little thing of that nature in there. So I took that experience and applied it to my own. All of a sudden, those pictures we pulled together as our new faculty, and some of our staff were like, whoa, 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 what are these? What are these pictures? These are amazing. And I'm like, well, they're just the new faculty. I just showed them in a different light. And like, these are fantastic because, again, I was new here, Nobody really saw the campus like this. They all saw it as like, just, hey, here's a standard headshot. Mm -hmm. Nobody saw personality. Nobody saw creativity. So then they were like, this is amazing. We want to pull this all together. So then that kicked off this like creative endeavor where every year the new faculty cohort that comes in, they get a special, unique photo shoot that I do not repeat with anybody else. The year after the hands series, I came in with an idea where I brought a chalkboard in and I wrote, had the faculty write why they chose to teach. And every message was different. It was personalized to what they did. The year after that, I brought in a thousand library books. The year after that, I had these like, you know, uh, they had this whole set with these like uh, light bulbs that turn, you know, one was turned on, you know, every year I've given a different stylistic photo shoot to this new faculty cohort in which I tell them, I don't repeat this with anybody else. So the chalkboard writing on that, that'll only be done with that group. Uh, I won't ever do that photo shoot again. And it's dug a very deep hole for me because every year I'm like, I finish it and I go, oh, that's good. Okay, I'm going to think about next year's idea now. And I go, all right, let me think about this. And then all of a sudden, oh, I got busy. Hold on, let me do all this stuff. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, next year's photo shoot is next week. What am I doing? Oh, I did not think about this. Okay. And I'm... You know, and everyone goes, well, why don't you take them outside? I'm like, well, I don't want to take them outside because then it changes everything. It takes them, the whole, you know, criteria has changed. Mm-hmm. Like I got to have it in a studio, do it with that. And so every year I think about this idea and then every year at the last minute I pull it off. And that is what allows me not to, you know, have this repetitiveness to kind of the things that I do. Uh, and I can apply that to other kinds of a uh, requests that happen every year where it's like, you know what, I'm just going to take my own liberty to go. 
hey, let's do it this way this year. You know, let's try this. And because I've been successful in that effort of creativity through those new faculty shoots, the, you know, campus clients that I work with, they go, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, Jason, whatever you want to do, you're, you're good. Go ahead and do it. We trust you. Um, What's been the responses so. from the staff when you do it and they see it? So I definitely take advantage of the fact that they're new faculty because okay. there is no way I could do this with retirees, okay. you know, because a lot of these sets, you know, they're, they're not silly, but you know, I'm like putting them in like this colorful yarn strings that hang from a ceiling. Right. And if I were to be like, Hey, retiree, come on in here. And they'd be like, no, son, I'm not going to do that. Good luck. <laughs> you know, just take your picture and be done. So I take advantage of these new faculty that come in that they're again, like I was new. Great. Whatever you need, happy to do it. They jump into that going, okay, sure. Yeah, we'll do this. And it typically ends up, they're just like, oh, that was fun. That was awesome. Oh, that was really great. Um, and I mean, cause that is a little bit of us here at Chico state is that we are casual. We like to have fun. We like to enjoy our time. We're not so head in the clouds or, you know, nose stuck up that we're just like, no, 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 no. It has to be proper. Like we do have our problem and circumstance, but we also like to have fun here. We like to enjoy, you know, what we get to do. And if it means being a little silly at times, then that's fine. You know, have you had one of those shoots? Maybe not that one where you got new st- new faculty, but any kind of shoot where you've set it up, you thought it was going to work out, and it completely just crashed and burned it right in front of you. Um, you're saying not just not necessarily the faculty shoot, but yeah, like but any shoot, any, yeah, done. any shoot at Chico where you're just like, I, this is going to work, and then you're shooting it, and you're just going, I am dying. <laughs> I mean, yeah. But usually because I've tried something so uniquely different, right? usually where it ends up landing is still good. Um, I don't think, I'm trying to think if I've ever had anything completely, um, you know, completely just crash. Um, I've certainly had failed shoots. I mean, I had one the other day, in fact. It wasn't, it wasn't like a, a big production of a shoot, but it was an idea I had in my mind. Again, mm-hmm. with our president, um you know, announcing her, her retirement, I was like, okay, she's talking with the porter out here in front of our administration building. So my idea is I'm going to get her kind of walking back into the building. It has our today decides tomorrow motto up at the top of the building. It's a great, you know, view of it. It tells that story of now, you know, her kind of departure and whatnot. So I'm there, I'm ready. And I'm like, this is going to work. This is going to be good. I'm going to like this. This is going to be fantastic. This is going to be awesome. Yes, 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 yes. And as soon as she finishes with porter, I'm like, oh, here he comes, here he comes, here he comes. And she heads to the door a student comes out of the door and it's a student who's wearing like this bright red shirt has a skateboard with a bright red helmet and just stands there holding the door open for it and ruins the whole shot. And I'm like, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and he's just kind of run with it. You know, you're just like, okay, I guess we'll just run with some other stuff we have. You know? um, Who let that and- idiot with the Rucker shirt come through the doorway. That's what she said. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, and it was just like, oh, I really thought that was going to be good, and and I and I've had that. I've had those moments where you, you you have something that you think like, oh yeah, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is, and then something happens, you know, whether it's in your control or not, and you're like, well, I guess we're not doing that. <laughs> have you had um, something 180 where you're like, uh, I'm hoping this works, and it's just gold, gold, and the faculty member is now just your best friend. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things that like I'll take that I just, I think that are like, that's nice. Um, And the reception of what that photo creates is something I wasn't able to predict, you know? Um, I Those are always nice. Those are always nice. Yeah. Yeah. And a couple of years ago, I photographed like this blood moon. um, uh, It was a, a, lunar eclipse over campus and like i knew i had like it was good it looked good you know but like i didn't really think much of it at the moment i was just like hey there's a photo of it nice that's great and but the reception of it was just like everyone's like oh my goodness that's amazing i want this i want this hey can we make a print of this can we put this up on our wall can we do this i was like oh yeah okay okay yeah yeah okay oh oh, nice all right this is fantastic (laughs) yay i'm good here and then everyone 
about it was happened like every uh, the next two like two years after that event occurred the celestial event occurred which was like this big moment two years later they go hey there's another blood moon coming what are you gonna do and i'm like oh oh i don't, I don't know well apparently blood moons happen like every two years so this big like amazing moment <laughs> that i thought now has built this expectation that like i get emails still to this day going hey there's a super moon happening are you gonna be that and i'm like Supermoon happens like every four months. No, it's it's not. It's only like sixteen percent bigger. You don't really actually notice, it. and you don't it. notice it. Yeah, it's <laughs> you know, yeah. So it's and it's it's fine. You know, I mean, I still get emails from people that say like, but that's you know, great though that that image touched them in a way that now they feel a connection to you to like let you know like this is coming, this is happening. Like that photo touched them in a way unheard of previous to you. So, and one of the really great things about this campus, again, gave me that trust is that um, when I came in, and again, a lot from my experience as a photojournalist, the images that were used for our campus through like social media um, got a lot of recognition. And I had kind of, I didn't push, but I had said, hey, it'd be nice if the work that was done on social media credited back to my, my social media accounts and, the, you know, give credit to the photographers effectively. And there was a couple of reasons. It has nothing to do with my ego. I don't need that at all. What it was, was that it, one, held me accountable. If my name's attached to the images that go out there, I'm going to make sure they look good. Right. The other thing was, is that it provided, um, it provided a little bit of a personal touch to what was created from this campus. When the images come out, there was, at least for me, and maybe because I'm a photographer, there's always a sense of like, well, who, who did that? I wonder who did that. When you don't have a name associated to that, whether it's a photo or even a story, when you don't have that credit attached to the content, you kind of go, oh, it's just some agency who did this, right? It personalizes it. And what happens from that is that now people on this campus who I've never met, never photographed, never interacted with, I'll walk by and they go, hi, Jason. And I go, hey, how's it going? And now I've become this ambassador to this campus. And... I'll be at events and every once in a while and I'll have people who go, Oh, Jason's here. Oh, okay. Okay. We're going to be Jason famous now. Okay. He's going to get us on social media. Like, okay. Yeah. And it becomes like, you know, like they become a part of this experience. And for me, that's really rewarding, you know, because now they can kind of, they see me running around campus with cameras and they feel connected now to the campus where if I had no name to what I did, they would be like, I don't know who that is. Where now a lot more people can be connected with the work that I'm creating here so that they do reach out to me and they've never interacted with me. And they tell me, hey, I saw an otter that's in our creek on the campus. You know, I just want to let you know, you know, or I'll walk back past them. They go, hey, I saw this over here. And we just start conversations because They've had an interaction with me through social media that they feel connected to me now when we meet on campus. And that is something very special that I've been able to to have here at Chico State that I wasn't ever had, you know, previously in my career. Right. I mean, that's what's the Instagram handle? Uh, it's at Chico State. No, no, yours. Your personal oh, one. Mine is at Jason Halley underscore CSU. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. We'll hopefully get you another 20,000 followers to point out, yeah. you know, otters wandering around your campus. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's great though, that people make that connection and immediately think like, we're a friend. I'm going to give you, tell you wildlife spottings or, you know, straighten up and clean my teeth when you walk into the room, because there's a connection just on an Instagram handle name. That's it. That's all it takes for them. Yeah, that's, that's all it is, is that that's our only interconnection, you know, that we have is this, you know, which, which, you know, it's not a connection and yet they've built this expectation that they know me now. And so when they see a person and they may not, they may not even know it's me, but they see like, oh, here's a person with cameras. And so they'll have an air like, you know, oh, hey, Jason, you know, and I have just understood that, you know, I'm not gonna be like, whoa, hey, who are you? What's, you know, like. <laughs> I'm right. going to be like, yeah, hi, how are you doing? You know, and, and I've had some people that I'm like, like even, even today, just earlier today, I was at an event, uh, in a business class, they were doing this career, career fair thing. And I had a student come up to me and was like, oh my gosh, hi. And I was like, Hey, how are you? 
and she's like, I don't remember if you remember me, but like you took my photo like a couple months ago, and I was and I was like, I, I think I, I were you were you by those bushes? But you, but you had your hair out, right? We took a photograph, your arms out, and everything. And she's like, Yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, Oh yeah, no, no, I get it, I get it. And it's like again, it's that you know personal you know connection that now we've made and had and carried That's through. Beautiful. You know, in these moments, um, again, if what you described where back in the newspaper, you'd see these individuals like once and maybe never ever see them again. Right. You know, here right. on this campus, we see these individuals quite often, you know, and so. I mean, that that is just it. People have no clue unless they're in our shoes, how powerful that is mm -hmm. to be able to make a connection with somebody on an image you took two two months ago. And, and you guys now have this connection that. You just doesn't happen anywhere else. Right. And again, this is about, again, offering them positive experiences. You know, my job here plays a role in how their experience of Chico State and their time here will be received. And everyone on this campus serves to that experience. And if you have one faculty member who said the wrong thing to a student or a staff who didn't give a student the time of day or administrator who didn't, you know, just say hi, that all speaks negatively of what they felt or how they felt connected to this place. So for me to play a role, to have people have personal connections to this campus through the imagery I take or through the interactions that I have with them, all benefits their experience of what they feel towards Chico state and the affinity they have to this campus. Right. So that in the long term. You know, as an alum, they'll be like, gosh, you know, Chico State was really awesome. And they really respected me my time there. You know, I want to be able to do that to other alum or other students that I may have an opportunity for. And it just passes the positivity out. Right. So, All right. So let's let's slip on our, our geeky tech shoes here and let's talk cameras. What what's your what's your day to day camera situation like? Have you dived into full fledged mirrorless or are you still holding on to your DSLRs? Where are you at? So we're, we're, we jumped into mirrorless. Um, we jumped in right before COVID hit. Um, we were actually at the time I was looking at mirrorless only because of the silent shooting mm -hmm. and the lightweight, cause I hated lugging things around and, um, and just to, just to have a camera like always on our hip. Right. I started going to a lot more meetings. And so I was like, oh, I just hate care of these. I had, I used to photograph, we shoot Nikon. Okay. I used to photograph with Nikon D810s with an extra battery pack. So it was just, it was heavy. I mean, it just, my, I could feel it in my back every right. day. And I hated carrying them around, even if I was heading over to a meeting and I'd carry it because I'm like, well, I don't know if I come across something. You never know if you come across that perfect right. moment, you know, that otter in the Creek that you're like, Oh, if I go get my camera and run back, it's going to be gone. So I was like, I need a camera that I can have on my hip that's small, lightweight, and oh, this offers silent shooting with mirrorless, which would be great for, you know, the events, speaker events, programs we go to where they you hear the clunk, 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 clunk. <laughs> and they go, can you turn your camera down? I'm like, no, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> so I, uh, so we bought two uh, Z6s, the first, first Z6s, um, and COVID hit. And I ended up just carrying that single camera around uh, with a 50 millimeter for 90% of everything I shot. Whoa. Uh, and it was fantastic. And I just used it. And I just all of a sudden switched. And then in COVID, we are, well, we hired a second photographer. We had one and then they, they left the campus for other pursuits. And so we hired a second photographer. So we, we bought new equipment for them to get started and so we, I was like, mirrorless, we go. And so we pulled in some mirrorless. And so now we both have two mirrorless. Uh, I have two Z, Z6s, Z, two Z6s. And our other photographer, Matt, has uh, uh, the two Z6s. And we're, we're mirrorless. And they're great. And my D810 um, is our headshot studio camera. It just stays in the studio now. And it's weird to go back to it. Like, <laughs> just like, oh. Um, but yeah, mirrorless is, is what we shoot with. Um, and so we have an assortment of lenses, um, everything from, so my go-tos as far as lenses choice, um, I'm definitely a fan of the F1.4s. So okay. I have a 24 okay. millimeter F1.4, the 50 F1.4, and then a 105 F1.4, which that one is, I've never recommended a lens in my life, but that one is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, just super clean and sharp and just nails his focus and gives a shot like unlike anything else. And so it's just, that one's, it's a, it's a really nice lens. Has but, that changed the way you shoot things? 
being mirrorless that you can um, kind of get into a moment where before you knew like I got a fr- I got a frame or two and then everybody's going to well, be looking at me. So what's actually funny is I, I a couple months ago I photographed a wedding with a former student of mine who was a second shooter and they had a digital SLR. Um, I think they had a Canon uh, 5D, I don't put mark whatever. And and I had the the mirrorless and they gave me their their whole take, you know, that I I went through and I edited for them for the whole shoot as a second shooter. And I going through their edits and going through like the first five or six pictures when they would shift the scene and they were either all dark or all overexposed before they like, Oh yeah, here we go. Take a picture over here. Snap, snap, snap. Look at it. And like, Oh, I got to change my settings. I don't get those anymore because when I look through the mirrorless, I immediately adjust to what I need it to be. Right. So I don't have those like sequence of shots where you switch the environment and you didn't switch the settings on it, you know? And so that was like a big change where I was like, Oh, I don't have those anymore. Oh Yeah. You know, that's so, a, if you think about that's a huge thing because a mirrorless mm-hmm. you, you, what you see is what you get. Absolutely. So you're on it. And if you're not, yeah. you're, you're under or over. Right. Well, and, and honestly, when I shot digital SLR, I would shoot aperture priority. Okay. Um, I'd shoot an aperture priority and then I would use exposure compensation to get, you know, brighter or darker to where the scene required. Mm-hmm. Um, and mostly because I, I knew what I wanted my apertures to be. And I, my shutter had a lot more latitude of kind of nailing it within where it needed to go. But I let the camera work for me. Now that I've been to mirrorless, because you do see what you're actually getting, I've actually been shooting manual. And I just make the adjustments manual because right. I have that control. And I have that control and I know what I'm getting. Where with the digital SLRs, I had control, but I kind of knew what I was getting. Yeah, there but could I, be a surprise. <laughs> yeah. So now with mirrorless, it's like I know what I get. and so I, And so I was able to get that. And so... It's, uh, it's here. Like it was that it was the thing of it's coming, but it's here now. Mirrorless mm-hmm. is definitely here. Yeah. And we, I've had some other, um, uh, university photographers who've bought into that Z nine, the Nikon Z nine. Uh-huh. Ooh, it would be so nice, but it's like, it's almost too much of a camera for the type of work we do. Yeah. Like the Z is definitely serve us for what we do well enough. I know. When when have you ever said to yourself while shooting an event, boy, I wish I had 20 frames a second? Like, <laughs> like never. I had I had the camera two weeks ago. They gave it to me for a weekend loaner. And it was ridiculous how many damn cards I was going through. Um, because the it's got a massive size file. It's oh yeah. Forty six or something. And right. then and then twenty frames a second. I was like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. Well, I I had, cause we, we had our, I had the eight tens that I used for a couple of years and those, um, those were about, I think the file sizes were about 40 megabytes or something. And I had a faculty member on campus who had bought a new uh, D 850 and he's like, Hey, I got an 850. You want to see it? And I was like, sure. Yeah. Come bring it by. Yeah. I want to see it. So he brings it by and, and then he shared a file with me and like those files are like a hundred megabytes. Cause those are like 45 uh, megapixel yeah. images, like a hundred megabytes per raw file. And I'm like, I'm fighting 45 megabytes on my D810. And I'm I'm like, I'm fighting space, finding available hard drive space on it. There's no way I can make a jump to 45 megapixel. And then, yeah, for the Z9 that has 20 frames a second on it, I'm like, I would I would go through hard drives every week. Yes. There's just no yeah. way that I IT could IT would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> We're going to have a talk with you, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> You're eating well, space. Currently, I know. Currently, right now, I think with all of our, um, like, of our university's campus server resource, um, I am, I don't know the numbers on this specifically, but I have a feeling I am almost as one department here with this, this just myself really as a main photographer and we have our second photographer. Um, I have probably the same, if not more storage capacity than our entire university needs. Oh, Oh yeah. I could. Yeah. yeah. Easily. So it's like, you know, two people are having the same amount of storage requirements that a campus of, you know, 16,000 need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. <laughs> That's good ratio. Very good ratio. Yeah. So you mentioned Matt, the other photographer, is he part-time or full-time? So he's full-time. Yeah. He's That's great. great. So there's two guys, you, you two guys working together. How does that work for you? Do you guys split it up uh, in the days, the hours, assignments? How does that work? Yeah, we're kind of crazy. We're all over the place. 
which just makes Matt, uh, um, Matt really great. Um, um, he, he came in, he did some athletics work for us previously. Um, and then, uh, he was hired in, uh, came in in June and he, what's, what's really great about Matt is he's super flexible. Okay. Um, and the life of photographers never happens between eight and five. <laughs> it, <laughs> no, it just doesn't. And Matt understands that. And he's really jumped up to be available for nights. He loves to photograph athletics. He loves to photograph theater performances. Um, so he has no problem kind of working a later shift, okay. which has been super helpful uh, as far as giving us coverage. Um, we do kind of shift around things a little bit because even with two of us on this campus, we can't really give a weekly coverage to everything. You know, if something comes up on Saturday, we have to shift it around. Oh, which then all of a sudden I hear know, opens you. up Monday. And so, um, so he's been great. Um, you know, and he, like me considers this, you know, a dream job. And, and as my boss before me, my job is to work for him and ensure he is happy and he has everything he needs. So that he stays here, uh, and gets the same benefits that I've had out of here. Right. When you look back at it, you know, for your years that you've been there, are you just today, are you kind of shaking your head going, wow, this is, this is unbelievable. I am living the dream. So when I first started this job and still to this day, uh, when I meet other photographers uh, or photographers, I know I tell them if I ever complain about my job, (laughs) just knock me across the face because I would have forgotten what I do have. Um, yeah, we get into our jobs and, and, you know, there's certain grievances and frustrations and, you know, tired and long days where you just go, Oh, is this worth it? And you can, you could easily take a negative route to it, but I have to daily remind myself of really prospectively, how good do I have it? I do have it really good. And that's why I tell the photographers that I know in town who are, who are hustling, who are trying to make ends meet, who through COVID really messed up their careers, uh, that I'm like, if I ever do complain about my job, just, just knock me across the face. You have full right to just, you know, punch me right in the chin, you know, go ahead and have it because I do have it good for what I get to do and for the campus that I serve here and having the support I have, um, you know, is, is fairly unmatched. Oh yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Did you, when did you first join UPAA? Yeah, so UPAA, uh, the University Photographers Associate of, Association of America, uh, was an organization that I became familiar with its existence when I started this job because I started going, well, well, who, what is this job? Who does it? What's this about? You know, what what community of university photographers is out there? So I was aware of them for a good, let's see, three, four years, um, and it wasn't until twenty, I believe it was twenty eighteen. Okay. In the latter of 2018, it may it may have actually been 2019, the beginning of 2019, that myself and our previous other second university photographer Jessica Bartlett had joined, okay. um, and and because it really honestly at that point, uh, our previous photographer Jessica was a former student who was just phenomenal, really great. And when she graduated, we were able to open up a position for her to get started, and she was very much like at that point when she started as staff, we were like okay. Now being part of this university group seems to make sense because the two of us can grow from this. When it was just me, I was like, ah, it's just me. It's just, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, uh, I see their stuff. Great. But I don't need to be a membership. But now with the two of us, then we joined. So I joined in 2019 and all of a sudden that like opened up so much opportunity for me to connect with others that did the job I do. Right. And that was very different because this is a really unique job in what I'm dealing with, what I get to do. And I had connected with other photographers in the CSU system at other Cal State uh, universities. Um, and, but there's there's kind of a few of us. There's not all the CSUs have a university photographer. Right, which is crazy. It's, it's a, yeah, wild. Mind-blowing, uh, right there. <laughs> Just So... And, and the professional development opportunities that I connected with, uh, you know, one being case, it was about, you know, philanthropy or staff or communications. And, and like, I was the one of three photographers there, you know, this whole organization. And so when I joined UPAA, all of a sudden I became part of this network of university photographers across the nation who are from large 
you know, systems and schools and small and community campuses. And yet we all have this common, you know, thread of wanting to be creative, wanting to have fun, wanting to create good work and working in an academic system. And a lot of it was super inspiring because I see these photographers who were doing, I'm like, Whoa, yeah, this is mind blowing work. Yeah. Mind blowing. Like, like way better work than a lot of commercial photographers who are out in the, you know, high paying job fields, right. You know, right. phenomenal stuff, super creative things, you know, and, and a lot of these photographers have come from newspapers. Um, you know, a lot of them have that skills set. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a group. What's really special about them, about UPAA is that it's a group that unlike other professional photography groups that very much are closed secrecy of like, all right, you got to pay to learn this. UPA is very much like everyone's best friend. Come mm-hmm. on in. What are you working on? What do you got going on? What do you do? How do you do that? Yeah. You want to learn this? This is how we do this. This is what we did here. We share so much um, about what we do and how we do it. And it's so friendly and everyone is there just to make our, ourselves feel better. Cause I've been part of like photojournalist group or local photographer groups and it, all those groups you come together and it feels much more like ranting of like, Oh, it's this and terrible. And I can't believe this. And the ridiculous. And I hate this. And it's, oh, this, oh, this is angry. And exactly. stuff. <laughs> where UPA was so much more positive, encouraging of like, well, yeah, this is awesome. Oh, you should try this. Oh, this is great here. Oh, this is fantastic over there. You know, and it's, it's way more sharing and positive and encouraging of a, a professional organization and we had the opportunity to go to their annual symposium uh, that was in Grand Valley uh, University in uh, Michigan in 2019. And at that point, I went from, you know, following all these individuals, you know, through the, the online platform to meeting them in person. And uh, even, <laughs> even it was at that time, uh, one of BYU's photographers, Nate Edwards, photographer of the year, yep. it was like his third year being photographer of the year. You know, he was just phenomenal photographer and we went to the symposium and I meet him for the first time and I'm like, ah, you're even nice. <laughs> it makes me hate you even more, Nate. Like, oh, why did you, couldn't you have just been a jerk and just being this egotistical, right. like university photographer of the year, and just been, like nose stuck up, like so I could hate you. But no, you're just like humble and super nice and super helpful. Damn it. Super like passionate, like, oh. And that's kind of the group. That's the group of these photographers that nobody comes in with this like giant ego of, Hey, I know what's good and I know what's best. And you're all just, you know, little minions that just do your own thing and you'll never know how good I have it. And it's like, no, everyone's there just to, just to be in the good company of each other. Right. Uh, so we've been able to, to be a part of that group. And since then we've, I've been able to kind of connect really well with the membership and, uh, was was nominated to serve on the board of the UPA organization. And now I serve as a board member um, for the organization and just trying to kind of, you know, continue to support the group and support people within the, the organization to ensure that they still see the same values and success and enjoy uh, being a university photographer that a lot of us do. When's the next uh, event? So the next event, so so we have a couple UPA onlines, if you remember, that we meet on Zoom kind of once a month, the third Thursday of every month to connect about topics or just conversations. We have monthly contests where each of us, we kind of turn in what we've uh, captured the previous month right. Um, right. to connect there. We have a Facebook group that we, every day, like, I mean, I'm like, I can't even keep up with the conversations. Oh, God, yeah, I can't keep up. <laughs> And then, um, but our, our big event, main in-person event will going to, is going to be coming up this, uh, June, 2023. And it's going to be in Notre Dame, uh, out in, um, South Bend, Indiana. So we'll be coming out to Indiana. Uh, um, there will host us uh, and show us all about, uh, Notre Dame. So <laughs> that's great. It's yeah. an unbelievable group. I, I can't remember how I stumbled upon it. Um, it was like literally some rabbit hole. I saw a photo, I clicked on it and I kind of, and I'm like, what is this UPPA? Like, uh, is it not NPPA? Yeah. Like, I'm so confused. I don't understand. And I just reading it and I was like, well, and it, and it's not, so we do, a, we're doing a little better, but we do a pretty terrible job of really promoting ourselves because a lot of it's just word of mouth. It's, right. You run into somebody, you find them and you go, Hey, be a part of the group. And because we're not an organization that's trying to make money, 
like we're not we don't have a marketing group we don't have a team we don't have staff right it's just us like the board members and the president we're working photographers yeah you're not we're selling all hats it. and t-shirts oh. and bumper stickers and whatnot it's just yeah. a group of guys we're, we're not we're not an organization that's trying to kind of just reap money out of people we're just trying to all hang out together we're all doing this while we're doing our full-time jobs as it is and it's really kind of surprising that it's run in the manner that it is, but it's a great group of individuals, you know, that connect. And, you know, like I said, we're, we're trying to do a little better kind of promoting the work of our membership to really showcase, you know, like if you are a young photographer who wants to get into photography, look at the avenues in this realm that you could be in at these universities who universities in general are trying to increase marketing and promotions and showcasing why and the wonderful and exciting things that they do on their campuses. Yeah. I mean, there is, there is work every month in that competition that would rival any annual report. Some of the best since sports illustrated no longer exists in the realm. When I worked at it, like some of the best sports photography being made, is by university mm -hmm. photographers, either whether they're with mm -hmm. the University of the Athletic Department, and it can be seen there. There's some commercial graphic stuff that is stunning. There's some portrait work that would knock your socks off and would make any creative director happier in hell to have it. I mean, it is phenomenal what's being made at some of these universities that some of them, and you know this, you might not have ever heard of before. Right. It's oh, not yeah. always just your BYU, Notre Dame, Florida, but it's your something something state valley eastern christian and you're like what where is that <laughs> right and, and, yeah, that, no, and that photographer's and killing it killing it oh yeah and, and that's what's i mean it's funny because it's like i've not i haven't done it since i've been a board member but i used to submit and i'd feel really good I'd be like oh yeah right really good with this and then i see what comes up and i'm like well holy cow <laughs> how did this come about like what Oh man, I'm doing it so wrong. Yeah, is there a delete but button? <laughs> but it's inspiring. It's yes. it really is and it's motivating, you know. And I know I know there's been some members who've just like been really, you know, like oh, there's no way I can compete. But I'll say even with the work that I had submitted at times, like I never got like the best in show, but I would I would get like a second or third, you know, uh acknowledgement in some. So, you know, you just you gotta keep, you know, pushing yourself and trying. Right. And what it, what it allowed me to do is it allowed me to actually I could easily go through the the assignments I have on this campus, you know, my job and, and just, just do what's needed, you know, but, and this is what I've I told our other photographer, Matt Bates. I was like, if you go and just do the assignment, you're never going to get an amazing photo. No. Right. All the amazing photos happen with your own intentionality behind it. So you do have to work for it. You do have to kind of like take the opportunity in front of you and go, Hey, let's do this you know, and then change it to meet the needs that you're trying to do, you know, or take that kind of discussion that talks about, yeah, hey, we want to try this photo for, we just need some portraits of our staff go. Great. That sounds awesome. Could we do this as well? Mm -hmm. And you'll find that that extra effort and intention gives you that extra opportunity, but you have to have that kind of that prompt of the, the contest, the monthly image contest to even make you go like, Oh yeah, think about what you're doing. And not just do what's in front of you, but really try to create something new that you feel like, hey, this is going to be special. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that that's it. You, it you've got to constantly be pushing yourself. You know, you're you're a blade. If you're dull, go sharpen it. And if it takes just looking at this contest and getting some ideas and some fresh perspective on just a mm -hmm. portrait or, oh, my God, I had no idea about this or that or why did they do And if you have a question on this site, you'll get an answer. If you're on Facebook or something, someone will tell oh, you. Yeah. They'll totally oh, yeah, walk you through it. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing. So Stephen Bridges was a University of Tennessee photographer. And he won Photographer of the Year three years in a row. And he just, and and we were like, we go to these symposiums, right? And so you get to meet him. Stephen is another guy. Nicest guy in the world. And you're like, oh, why are you so nice? <laughs> oh, okay. You're so nice. You're so great. And he has that Southern charm too. And, so, and that gets you too, the Southern charm. I know. I know. <laughs> and so he goes... And you go, you find out like how he, his approach to how he works. And like, he has a wall that he basically every day puts a picture up and his objective is the next day to get a better picture than what's up on the wall. And so by the end of the month, he has worked every single day to get the best picture that he possibly can get out of that month. I mean, he takes that so seriously but then the payoff is the absolutely incredible 
ability and skill level of his work is consistently exceptional because every day he's fighting on it. Right. You know? Right. And so, um, and, and then, what, you know, you go, great. I will never be the university photographer <laughs> of the year. I don't work that hard. There's no way I'll take that much attention and detail to it. <laughs> you know? But it gives you a bar to strive for. It right? does. It, it does. does. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and sometimes that's all you need is you need somebody with that Southern charm just to push you over the edge a little bit to get you through yeah. the day and be like, all right, damn it. Yeah. I'm taking well, second and, and place. <laughs> And the thing about it too is that he's super happy to share his process, super happy to share his workflow, his approach. And, and yes, we've, you know, connected through, you know, online and, you know, on the internet and whatnot, but through the symposiums, we've been able to connect in person. And now I have that personal connection with them that if I'm like, I'm struggling with this, I need to know how to do this. I can send him an email and he's going to reply going, just do this way, yeah. you know? Or if I need a critique of a particular image where I'm like, something's not right here. I need to see how this is done. You know, again, you have that person working in that same environment that if I show this to, you know, any staff here on this campus, you know, they're going to be like, Jason, that looks great. That's awesome. And I'm like, no, no, no I, yeah, I know. But what's, what can be better of it? You know, where this group will be like, well, did you think about this? Did you try this? What was this approach here? Do you have this option here? And I'm like, oh yeah, I never thought about that. You know? Yeah. That's all you need. It, and then a lot of us just from the monthly image contest, because we see each other's work or through our social media uh, on Instagram, a lot of us steal our own ideas. Sure. You know, a lot of us see thing. We were just like, oh, I'm totally doing that. You know, and we're all happy about that. We're like, yeah, do it better. You know, yeah. like do it better. You know, Add so. your color to it, whatever it takes. Exactly. Yeah. But there's, you, you'll, if it, once you're in the group for a while, you'll start seeing some images that you've been like, I've seen that style before. <laughs> it looks good. What did it? Somebody else did that too, you know, but nobody's, nobody holds grudges towards each other. Nobody goes like, ah, oh, they stole it from me. You know? well, they, they, they need it in the annual report at the university of Washington. No one's going to complain at Southern Illinois that that might look yeah. like the same portrait. No yeah. one's saying that. Just get right. the, just right. make beautiful images. That's what they're worried about. Yep. What's the future holds for Jason? Where do you see yourself in five, 10 years? Ooh. I, I was telling somebody that like, you know, cause I've been real busy with assignments and whatnot. I was telling one of our staffers, I was like, you know, one of these days it's going to be exhausting for me to be lugging all this gear around campus, rolling all these carts, you know, carrying all this stuff upstairs and whatnot. And I'm like, I got to figure out a way to like come into campus, photograph some nature stuff in the morning for like an hour and then do headshots where I just meet people every day, you know, for, and do that for five hours where it's just open, open hours. Anyone comes in, I just meet whoever comes in, have a little chat with them. They go on, they get a good picture whatnot, <laughs> edit those through the days and then, and then just go home at the end of the day. Right. And, and I was like, I think I, I think I may do that eventually when I retire, you know, get to that retirement age where I can't walk around anymore. And then I had a busy week and I was like, can I do that now? <laughs> Can I, is that is that possible for me to just do that now? Why am I thinking retirement? I got to figure out a way to like have, create a system here on campus where I have enough support of a team <laughs> that I can just come in the morning, photograph some outdoor nature and beautiful light, and then just be in the office, just kind of editing some stuff and on the computer, looking online and just take headshots as they come in, yeah. have a conversation with somebody and then they can go about their day. And then I just, that was it. That was my day. I don't yeah. have to race around and sit in your car to get something. <laughs> I don't have to drop it. Yeah. I just, I'm just chilling here and you know, just, just do it again the next day. You need a little Sounds cardigan like and a pipe and you just sit in your room, <laughs> let people come in and I'll have a little coffee, make an espresso. That's they it. can come in, they can chat for five minutes. You know, have a good conversation, and then we can just take a photo, and then we finish up our conversation. They can be on their day, and it's it, perfect. You'll get the next one at ten thirty when they show up. In, in a perfect world, <laughs> that will be where I am in the next five years. Is is at a re retirement stage in my mindset? <laughs> in a uh, in, the re in the realistic world, who knows? You know, our campuses are going through through enrollment challenges. You know, and that's nationally across the realm. You know, where where enrollment's really important, and it's going to have impacts to budgets and resources. Are you guys down need. a little bit? We are, and uh, and we we don't know the full impact yet. You know, we're still, uh, but but it will impact us. You know, everyone's still trying to stay hopeful and hey, we'll we'll be able to recruit. Um, and, uh, but, but there's no, I mean, nationally enrollments are down. Right. Uh, and so I know that photography will play a large role 
in providing that window for others to see what it's like to be mm-hmm. a student here. And as long as our our academic priorities are in line with offering and serving the needs of students, affordability, value education, and skill development, then what we are able to show through pho- photography, um, that will be able to, you know, find find that window for people to kind of come into. So, um, yeah, f- I mean, five years, I don't know. I mean, I like where I'm at. I like working here at Chico State. I have no intentions to move on. I'm very well supported here. I don't see that changing. Um, I would like here to kind of expand the role a little bit more in the sense of, you know, kind of pull away from the the kind of, yeah, that was nice to do, but doesn't really serve the bigger, you know, right. initiatives of the campus. Um, like like many other university photographers, Um I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that I'll be able to do that a little bit better, refine the job that I do a little bit better. Um, and, um, you know, our, like I said, our second photographer, Matt Bates, who's come in, he's been phenomenal to give me that that time a little bit more to be able to kind of pivot a little bit to those higher priorities. Um, but I'll, I mean, I'm, I'm in this job until I either, you know, pass out or die and, you know, fall off a cliff or something, but they rip I'm, that I'm sweater cardigan off you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's, it is, like I said, it's something that I've been so rewarded, uh, both from being able to take care of my family in this role, but then also in just my personal rewards from the people that I interact with, you know, the feeling of value that I give to them and then the reward that I see in their growth, you know, seeing, seeing some of the students that I've been able to photograph in passing at an event when they were a freshman to seeing them walk across the stage as a graduate you know, and having those picture from beginning to the end of their journey is incredible, you know, and one of the most disappointing parts of this job that no one ever tells you is that you see these students with such like this full plate of opportunity that they get to embark on and you're you're only there for the beginning. Yeah. You know, so, you know, like, oh, they're going to be good, but then they go. (laughs) You know, and you're like, well, are they going to come back? <laughs> you know, they were really awesome, you know, and it it's kind of this tease, right? That you, you get to meet, you know, these individuals that come in and they're so full of energy and excitement and potential and then they're out yeah. and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Bye really baby cool. bird. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it happens all the time. You build a relationship with them and then the next year they're gone and you're like, they were really awesome. <laughs> They were so and photogenic so, and they did everything I, I wanted. Absolutely. And so, um, and that's just, that's, I, that's the thing that they never told you about this job that you're going to meet incredibly good people who are getting primed for great things and they'll leave you. <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's really hard. <laughs> so. And they leave you. You make it sound like you lose a lover. She's off. She goes. Like, but that's what it is when you have a good subject. It's oh, yeah. it's so painful. Like they, they mm-hmm. were everything for you, and then boom, just like that, you gotta yeah. look for your. I next will one. say though, I will though say some do come back. <laughs> I've had some alumni who come back for programs or events, uh, or you know, or we're still connected through social, you know, and so. I even had one the other week who was at a business career fair that that was part of the business school that I would photographed when they were in a program here and they came back and they're like, Oh, Jason, it's so glad to see you. Hey, and, you know, and it was just like, like back old times. Right. You know? So like, you know, that's, they're not gone forever. Right. You know, but they, but they do, you, you build this relationship with some of these students, you know, just to, to follow them and guide them in their, their academic pursuits at a time when they, they have a lot of questions of their own direction, right? Mm-hmm. And so you kind of counsel them through of like, you can do it, you're going to do great. And this is awesome what you're doing. It's incredible. And you see them achieve that graduation and then they're out and you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> they'll be good. They'll be good. You know, <laughs> you still, does your heart still pitter patter when you push that button? Are you still loving taking pictures? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's my problem. Like, I mean, you know, part of the, the biggest problem of this job is being okay, not covering everything because there's just no way. And we get requests from people, you know, who it's a, it's like, okay, how are we going to cover? How are we going to cover this? Like, this is another Saturday. 
how are we going to do this? You know, and I have other staff who go, you, you can't just say, no, it's fine. We'll right. figure it out. Right. It's a last minute request. Don't do it. You're already overworked. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, I know, but it's really important to them. And then it's a, it's a struggle to get to that point to take the picture. But once I'm pushing the button, I don't want to be anywhere else. You know, it's like, I'm right there and I'm a part of it. And I even went the last, this last couple of weeks, uh, weekends, our recreation, hospitality and parks management class. Uh, I talked to a faculty who came in for a headshot was like, Oh yeah, what do you do? What do you, you know, everything. And he's like, Oh, I take kids on the field trips. We're going actually going to go on some field trips. If we want to ever call them, you're welcome to. And I was like, sure, that'd be awesome. Yeah, totally. I'll be there. Let me know when it is. So we actually planned this trip going out to Sequoia national park for a weekend, three day trip. And so I was like, awesome. And then as the weeks developed out and things came out, I was like, oh, this is such a busy weekend. Why am I doing this? Like, I have, oh, this is just too much. Why? And then I get out there and I was just like, this is great. Students are out there in nature. They're hiking around. They're seeing stuff. I mean, I'm like on vacation. Yet I'm like, I'm working, right? I'm paying here to be here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's an enjoyable time. And then one of the, the trips uh, or one of the evenings on the trip, they went on this kind of night hike um, on this little trail. And I got this photo of them up on this ridge silhouetted behind the night sky with stars, you know, just full bright of the night sky, just, you know, hundreds of them that you can see. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just like, does it, does it, the trip was worth it. This was fantastic. This was worth the six hour drive there. This is great. I love it. So walk me through that. What, what is your process when you, when you have something like that? What are you thinking? What do you got to take? What do you got to, you know, shoot with? Are you thinking bring a tripod? Like what's your visual process to prep you for any kind of event that might happen in those three days? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm trying to bring what I can carry. Um, I knew that we were going to be shooting at night. Um, I also knew being on the outdoors, you know, under the stars would be good. So I was like, I know I have to have a tripod. Um, when we were, I didn't know the full itinerary of the trip. And so I knew that when we went uh, to, to go, he was like, we're going to go on a night hike, right? Because they're like, someone's doing a night hike. We didn't end up getting to meet the the person who was going to walk us and part of the park system. Um, so the faculty was like, well, I could just take you all. We'll just do it ourselves, you know? And so I was like, great, we'll just do that. So I knew that like, well, it's really dark. I knew that I needed a tripod um, and I'm going to need that, you know, 24 millimeter or the 50 millimeter with, with 1.4 so that I could see in the dark with the camera. Right. I that having like a flash or even having like a, a flashlight is almost too much light for how dark it is. So I was like, really, it's just my phone. Like the screen of my phone is going to bring enough light if I need to light anything of the scenery. I was like, honestly, it may be more just like light painting of the scene. And and for the most part, it's literally just me just following and just trying to find just some good compositions. And so when we were walking by, you know, I was just trying to get photos of there's the students in those spaces so that the work, the images that I'm creating show, um, you know, what it's like to be a student on this excursion. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of following with them, right? And what it came was is just as many of the photos do, right? I don't really plan them out to any much detail. I just am lucky where I, I'm i walking behind them because I was packing up the tripod and I just look over and it's you just see it. You just see the shot in front of you. You just know it's there. And so then they're up on the ridge and I just plant the camera on a tripod and I'm just, you know, over, like just letting exposure go. And I'm just trying to take as many as I can in the moment. And I'm just hoping for it to, you know, something to come out there. You know, and Were so, you worried about battery life? No, I had plenty of batteries. Okay. Yeah. I, I knew that I brought plenty of batteries because I knew I wouldn't maybe necessarily have power out there. So I made sure to have, um, you know, plenty of batteries in there and such. So. Did you guys tent or cabin? Uh, so the students tented. Um, I've been there. Not I haven't been to Sequoia National Park for the first time, but I've been camping on a tent that wasn't weathered, not the right 
you know, weathered uh, temperature sleeping bag. Right. So I was like, I, one of the first questions I asked when I got there, I was like, how far are we parking away from our campsite to the faculty? And they were like, oh, it's, it's right at the campsite. You can park right there. And I was like, great. I'm going to sleep at the back of my Durango. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm not going to sleep outside on a tent. I've done that. I'm just going to put the pads in the back of the Durango and I'll just, I'll sleep in there. You know, so I, I actually slept Perfect. okay. And I was like, yeah, they, some of the students, they set up in the meadow and I was like, it's going to get a little wet. I'm like, do I tell them that? I don't know. This is going to be a good photo though. I just, they'll, they'll figure it out. You Let, know? Them learn. It. Let them yeah. learn. Yeah. So one of, one of the students, you know, came out and he thought he had bought a tent and he actually just bought a netting. So it's just like a mosquito netting. So it looks like a tent, but it's all hollow. Like it's just, it's netting. Oh God. It's not a it's not a tent. Yeah. And it wasn't too cold, but it got cold. It was like in the mid thirties, I think the temperature down the night. So it was, it was cold and he had a sleeping bag and everything, but it, he did not have a tent. And so he, he needs to say he didn't sleep really through the night. He was too cold. He maybe slept maybe an hour. So the next day when we were hiking around after we did the students did a service project, everyone kind of had a bit of free time to go about and, I was like, okay, well, I think I'm going to go back to the camp and just kind of get things, you know, edited out, processed in, get on that. Um, I didn't want to chase everybody around the, the state park. Yeah. So the other student was like, are, are you going, you're going back to camp? And I was like, yeah, you want to go? He's like, yeah. He, he didn't last maybe 10 seconds in the car. He was just out cold, you know? And so I was like, I, I've been there. I felt for him because yeah. I've been that student before in my young experiences camping out with friends and just like you just bring what you have and you think it's good and then you realize oh no i really should have bought that 180 dollar camping you know uh sleeping bag that's rated for zero degree temperatures because <laughs> yeah that probably would make a difference so. test your stuff before you go that's always yeah. a good thing build it up in your backyard Jason, thank you for your time. This is great. I am uh, glad we were able to connect. Uh, I'm glad we could tell people we have one of the best jobs on the planet because I'm telling you, being a university photographer is fantastic. It is a well, great thing. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, it, it's unbelievable every day, and I love it. And again, I'm giving so much support to do what I do, which is not common, and I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Thank you for your time, man. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Jason. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the like button and become a subscriber to the podcast. Remember, you can follow the Just a Good Conversation podcast on Instagram and find all of our past shows at the website, justagoodconversation.com. Thank you for listening.